Hello and a warm welcome to World Baptist Church and our edited recording of our service on the 1st of May, 2022. Jesus is King and I will extol him. If you're able, please stand to sing.
Yes, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we come as your people here this morning to join together in praise and in worship, but also as we've just sung, to serve you, our Lord and King. Speak to us, we pray, through your word, through our service this morning. And if you want to show to us new ways in which we can serve you, then, Lord, give us listening ears that we might hear what you are saying to us, your people. Hear our prayer. Be with us, we pray now, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Right, the actions go like this. You clap your hands together. And then you clap the right hand, so that's like a diagonal, like, like that, is that diagonal? Clap hands in the left one. Clap hands back of hands, both of them. And then clap hands in front of hands. It, it goes a little bit quicker, but you'll be fine. <laughs> so your clap, side, clap, side, clap, back, or front. Oh, there's not a clap in between, I got that bit wrong. Right, right, let's do it once more, right. So clap, side, clap, side, clap, back, front. And then you do it again. And then when we get to the verse bit, you have to make a box like that. And then you have to move your box out of the way. Sudden movement to the side. Go careful if you're sat next to somebody. And then... And then we wag our finger and we point up there as well that goes with the words okay now it's a bit of a challenge in the song that it starts nice and gentle for you so that you can just warm up and get your clapping going or your air clapping or your two meter distance clapping or however you'd like to clap hands and <laughs> it gets a bit quicker though so take advantage of the slower start so that when we get to the end you're you're on fire Everyone paired up, everyone happy with their partner option or their air option. Everyone that would like to can get on their feet because obviously we like to move around. Sandra, my glamorous assistant, as always. Right, Sarah's going to put the music on. The people on the screen might even give us a little guide to what's going on. The words go are very easy. God can do anything. God can do anything. Don't put him in a box, don't shove him in the corner, don't you limit what he can do, don't put him in a box, don't shove him in the corner, don't you limit what he can do, don't put him in a box, don't shove him in the corner, don't you limit what he can do. I've just discovered that Sandra and I can't sing and concentrate on clapping at the same time. Oh, how'd you get on? Right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, lovely to see you. Right. Oh, I'm on. Then. Yes, you did hear me say good morning, didn't you? I don't really need a microphone, do I? I'm loud. <laughs> always have been, always will be. Right, children. Now then, we're thinking now about anything that God can do. And sometimes he has to do miraculous things, especially where I'm concerned. So I've been thinking about all the good things that we love to do for God. And I also made a little list. And I also made a list of sometimes, because we do make mistakes, don't we, at times? 
Um, you know, we have to stop and think about those. But I just thought I'd read a few out to you. So this is my goodness. I said my prayers every day this week. And I was able to look after my friend's cat while they went away on holiday for a few days. Now, that was a good thing. And I went to visit a friend who lives on her own. And I thought that was rather a good thing to do. And for Michael, I was very good because I cleaned the inside of the car. Oh. Mind you, it was because Harley had made all the crumbs and he was not happy. So I cleared them up before he found them. But there we go. That was a good thing, wasn't it? So that's my good list. Well, then I made a list for my mistakes. <laughs> ah. Oh, dear. Oh, I think I'm going to need help here. Well, I, I'm not going to read them all out. I'll just read you a few that I'm prepared to admit to in public. <sighs> well, I didn't get all the ironing done. So when Michael wanted his clean shirt, I had to rush off quickly and iron it because it wasn't ready. And I spent two weeks off and never got any of the weeding done that I should have done. And then the other day when I went over the road, I forgot my shopping list and I forgot half my shopping because I was trying to do it from memory. And I, oh dear. And then when I was doing my housework, I got fed up and I didn't finish the dusting. It's still there. It's now waist high instead of knee high. And the other thing was, I didn't clean the windows. Oh dear, but yeah, but you don't want to hear any more about my lists. I mean, oh dear, there, there's just so many things. And you know, when I get sort of busy like that and I have to sort of, oh dear, my, my bad things always seem to outweigh my good things. And do you know what? I think I'm going to have to have some help here. So what I plan to do this morning, kids, is we're all going to go out the back now and we're going to discuss all my mistakes and find a way that we can put those right. Are you with me to help me this morning? Because I really do need this help. I can't do it on my own. So shall we go then? And we'll leave the, uh, the grown-ups then to... I'm on. I'm on it. Thank You're you on it. Oh, good. Thank you very much. We'll see you later. I will explain to you how we've got on. I don't know about you, but yesterday I, I picked up a newspaper. I only get a newspaper on Saturdays. And I just felt totally overwhelmed and despairing at the state of our nation, at the state of the world. It's all just very depressing. I just, I don't know what to say. I went to the cafe, Oscar, uh, the drive through and got very frustrated at the length of time I had to stay in the queue and all the flashing things and the poor staff there listening to their things, trying to do this, trying to do that. I thought, what are we doing? Why, why are we doing all this? Why is there so much rush? And I'm getting impatient. I can't have my coffee with exactly the right milk I want and everything. And, and then I got home and I picked up this magazine. And I was just so encouraged. I don't know if you've all had it through your door. And it's always so encouraging because the very first thing is church or community. And there's always a, a little article by, by Andy Pierce. And it was just so amazing, this one. Talk about where salvation is found. And it has this verse. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. And God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, that says, to the nation of Israel, a heartfelt offer of salvation and strength. But Israel would have nothing. Of it. I was just encouraged. Sometimes that word repentance makes me feel like oh. Wonderful, liberating the acute, our, our society is just marked by unrepentant, unrepentant attitudes that everyone gets cross at everyone else's unrepentant attitudes. So but God offers us salvation, offers us repentance. Um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to repeat those words every now and again. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. The Holy One of Israel. Repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength. Instead of, but you would have none of it. The opportunity for us to say, Amen, Lord. Because I was reading the other day as well, another prophet, Jeremiah, and I was just struck. God speaking 
what he's going to do for the nation. It's not all good. And Jeremiah suddenly just says, Amen, Lord. So you don't need to say amen to my prayers because you might not agree with them. But I'm sure we can all say amen to God's prayer for us. And he wants repentance and rest, salvation and strength for us. So let's pray. Lord, we come before you, feeling the weight and despair of all that's going on in our world and nation as a result of our failures and poor choices that ultimately lead us to disaster. Our failure to live as you intended us to live and to accept your instruction. But we thank you for the promise of salvation and strength through your gifts to us of repentance and rest. Please help us today to accept your invitation to repent and to rest for ourselves, our community, our nation, and our world. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength. We say, Amen, Lord. Firstly, for ourselves, we acknowledge the bad choices that we've made because of our own stubbornness, selfishness, belief in our own opinions, refusal to listen to others, our need for others' approval, and yet the way we have judged others, frustration and even rage sometimes when we don't get our own way, the habits, that we've allowed into our lives. But we know that these things are impossible for us to change on our own. And sometimes we're just happy to continue in because it's easier. But instead, we choose to change our mind, to change direction, and embrace your wonderful salvation, your freedom from these things that ruin our lives and the lives of those around us. We receive your complete forgiveness. Thank you so much, Lord, for the cross. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One, my life says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. We say, Amen, Lord. So we thank you for our community. Thank you for this magazine and the many positive community ventures it mentions. Thank you that each edition starts with a message from you each month. We pray that you will bless that word in every home where it is received or that people will read it and will be encouraged, Lord, in this positive way to embrace what you are offering to them. But we thank you for so many things in here that we can pray for. And I'm struck as we pray for our own toddler group this week, for the others that are mentioned in this, in this magazine that also meet on a Thursday morning, for the St. Paul's Church Whirlbury School and for the one at um, St. Peter's in Milton, Lord, we pray for them that in those situations too, young people, children, families will be encouraged to rest in your salvation and to repent. So this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Western and World says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. We say, Amen. But we thank you that your offer of salvation and strength is given to a whole nation, not just the church or to selected religious or especially spiritual individuals. We bring before you our nation. We acknowledge with shame that we failed as a country to honour you and to be righteous in our dealings with other nations and in our stewardship of what you've blessed us with. We failed in many ways, although we've often boasted of our place in the world. Please forgive our arrogance and hypocrisy. Help us as a nation to change our ways and attitudes to those nations around us. We pray especially for our government at this time. May the calling out or covering up of unacceptable behaviours and attitudes lead instead to an understanding of what sin is. The willingness to name sin as sin and to admit the need of forgiveness from God from something that is endemic in all our lives. We thank you for those who've been willing to admit their mistakes and see the need to change their own behaviours. We pray that you'll be compassionate and bring about forgiveness and restoration. 
and as many vote this week in local elections. We pray that the focus will be on what is best for communities as a whole and not our own personal interests. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of the United Kingdom says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength. Please say it. We name before you now other countries that are in the news and on our hearts. Russia, Ukraine, Syria. Maybe those countries that we as a nation have not treated so well. We ask you, Lord, that you will reveal your hearts for them, your heart's desire to bring salvation and your strength to each one of these nations. Please help the people and their leaders to be able to accept Grant repentance to those who are set on a path of their own, finding their own solutions, a path that leads to destruction. Grant rest to those who are desperately trying to fight for survival. Trust to those who don't know where to turn or who to believe. Quietness to those who are surrounded by the noise and turmoil, fear and war. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Russia, Ukraine, and all the nations we have named before you. This is what he says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength. We say. And Lord, we choose to rest. Lord, we ask you to help us to stop striving, stop worrying, stop wanting. Thank you for your offer of deep, purposeful rest as we come to you, Jesus. Rest in the deepest part of our minds and being. Rest that enables us to work alongside you, in your unforced rhythms of grace. Thank you so much for your gift of Sabbath. We thank you particularly for this weekend when many of us have an extra day of rest from work. We pray for the families in our church that what remains of this, this weekend will be a really significant time for their growth and walk together with you. And we pray for those for whom tomorrow will be yet another day of frenzied work, struggling to earn enough to live on, or addicted to work, making more money. Pray for those for whom tomorrow will be no different, in fact harder maybe, because the activities that break up the monotony of the week won't be fun. And we pray for all those around the world for whom 1st of May is an important day, fighting for justice, fair labour, and good conditions. We thank you for the labour laws that we have in this country. We pray for those in other countries who know them too. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the creator of all people, who put us on this work, earth to work the ground and care for it, to walk and talk with him in the cool of the garden. This is what he says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. We say. Now, if you have a, your Bible with you, I'm going to be reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and from verse uh, 9 um, through to verse uh, 20. Mark tells us that at that time, um, this is uh, right at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted, tested by Satan. He was with the wild animals. And angels attended him. 
After John, that's John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So, the Sea of Galilee. Use some imagination. You're going to take up a new hobby or a new way of life. You've decided to take up fishing. Why have you decided to take up fishing? I've really no idea. It's certainly not on my to-do list to take up fishing. But let's, let's stay with that for a moment. If I were about to take up fishing, then the first thing I would do would buy a book called Fishing for Dummies. How many of you know the Four Dummies uh, series of books? They're great. The first one I ever got was called DOS for Dummies. Some of you remember the dim and distant days of computers when it wasn't a Windows computer, it was a disk operating system called DOS, and I used to study it, and some of you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, no, but that's all, there's no idea at all, no. Uh, but from that, the Four Dummies series of book has, has really proliferated, and you can now get a, a Four Dummies book on practically every other subject you could like. I've got quite a few at home. Um, there's, uh, there's Windows 10 for dummies. That's my latest one. Whenever things go wrong on my computer, I look up Windows 10 for dummies. Um, uh, what else have I got? Oh, Leadership for Dummies. Uh, when that came out, I thought I'd better get that because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. And so on and so on. And um, some years ago, I came across Christianity for Dummies and also the Bible for Dummies. And actually, they're very good books. And I, I would recommend them because they're written in a very accessible way with sort of humor thrown in um, as well. So that's the For Dummies series. And yes, there is a Fishing for Dummies. So one of my first things, oh, when I first came here over two years ago now, I had to get to know Facebook. I didn't have a clue, did I? Uh, not, not a clue. And Ali helped me out. But I then got Facebook for Dummies. And I'm still a dummy at Facebook. It, I really don't get on with it one little bit. But there you go. So you've take, decided to take up fishing and you've got your book, Fishing for Dummies. But then you've got to decide, well, what sort of fishing and where? Will you go fishing in a river? Will you go fishing in a lake? Or will you go out to sea? Uh, and will you use a net? Um, will you be on the shore? Will you use a rod and line? I notice people at Western on the front when the tide's not out. It doesn't seem to be very often. They've got a, you know, a line and they're trying to catch some poor fish that was going about its business quite innocently. But there you go. So you've got to make these decisions about taking up fishing. Now, reading about fishing is fine as far as it goes. But then I'm thinking I would need somebody with some experience of fishing to actually show me, not well, not the ropes, show me the line or whatever it is. As someone who would know the local conditions, where the best place was to, to pitch. Um, have any of you been following that? Uh, oh, what's his name? The fishing, that fishing, a couple of gents going fishing. Bob Mortimer, Mortimer and my house. Yes, they do that fishing thing. There we are. Um, you can pick up tips on fishing in a river. I think they do fishing. There. So if you watch that, and apparently there's quite a bit of comedy in thrown there as well. But, so, Let's say that we're going to go fishing for a living and the chosen spot is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I don't know if it's allowed these days or whether you need a license. The, the level of the Sea of Galilee has dropped considerably, I understand. And um, the last time I checked, 10 years ago, um, fishing was not allowed in the Sea of Galilee unless you had a very special license. Not that that bothered me at all because I had no intention of applying for a license and going fishing in the Sea of Galilee at all. But if I was looking for ice back in the day, 
I could have done a lot worse than find Simon and his brother uh, Andrew, two experienced fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. And they could have told me everything that I would needed to have known to become a successful fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. We just started a new sermon series entitled From Simon to Peter, looking at his journey of discipleship from a fisherman who was minding his own business and catching fish. And then Jesus comes into his life and he becomes a changed man. But it's a gradual process. Hence the title from Simon, the name by which he was known, and then Peter, the name that Jesus gave him. And this week, we're looking at a new role profile. Last week, it was a new name, and now a new role profile. Reading between the lines in the opening there of the gospel, I suspect that Jesus already had met and knew quite a bit about both Andrew and and Simon. It's quite likely there had been some connection between Andrew and Simon with John the Baptist, whose ministry preceded Jesus, and um, there was some sort of link going on there. Jesus then used what was familiar to them to introduce them to something new. He used something that was familiar to them to introduce something uh, new. Because from now on, Jesus wanted to equip them to be able to fish for people. Again, an old Sunday school song started going through my head, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Uh, one of these uh, days we're going to have, uh, have a uh, nostalgic run through old songs, aren't we? Uh, and see how we get on. Sandra's looking a bit, uh, yeah, but uh, some of the songs that go back a, a long while. I, I can remember in uh, Junior Christian Endeavor, whenever the offering was taken up, we used to sing a song called Hear the Pennies Dropping. Hear them one by one. Anybody ever know that song? Say yes, not just we hear the pennies dropping. Oh, dear me. So we, we could have a, a sort of a, a cheesy section and a more serious section of songs that you've known once and have forgotten but have been revived in World Baptist Church. It happened here first, folks, I tell you. So you want to keep coming. Anyway, I've forgotten where I am in the sermon now. It's the reference from Mark. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Then he said to, well, that's the fishing analogy. Sometimes, however, Jesus would use a different analogy, uh, depending on who he was speaking to. And one of the most well-known, of course, is Jesus' reference to um, harvest. Um, the harvest is plentiful, this is from Matthew 9, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. But whatever the preferred analogy, whether it's fishing or, or whether it's you know, being a farmer, the truth is this, that Jesus wants each one of us to do our bit in bringing other people closer to him. To bring in people onto that journey of finding faith in Jesus. Jesus wants it to happen here and everywhere. Or as he once put it following his ascension and before he went back to heaven, he said this to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Jesus still wants that commission to be happening. Paul said that any church worth its salt must be an Acts 1-8 church. We have our own uh, immediate local mission, and then there's the sort of the town or the county or the country in which we're placed, you know, our Judeas and Samarias. When I was in, a minister in Wales, it was easy for me to equate Samaria with England across the border, but, I, I, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody, so I, won't, I don't say that anymore. So I'm telling you what I don't say, but I once said. And then, of course, the ends of the earth, the rest of the world. Let's stick with this fishing analogy and uh, see what we can pull in uh, a, a little bit more. Reel it in. Oh, you're not very quick this morning, are you? <laughs> As I mentioned, there is more than one way of fishing. 
It depends whether you're on the high seas, whether you're in coastal waters, or whether you're in a freshwater lake or in a river. And a fisherman with skills in one type of fishing might be completely useless at fishing in another context. Obviously, you, know, you wouldn't go out on the North Sea and you on board a trawler and then throw a line over the edge. You know, you just wouldn't do it. So, you know, not every type of fishing is always appropriate to the context in which you find yourself. And effective, if you like, evangelistic strategies will vary from time to time, from culture to culture, and from context to context. You know, I was brought up in the days of, you know, people pitching up quite literally and putting a big tent up. Um, and, you know, you'd have a crusade, as we called it, um, for a week or more. You know, Billy Graham and these, these big events. And there'd be a focused thing on evangelism. I would suspect that actually, culturally, those days have gone. And in more recent times, it's things like Alpha that have taken center stage. Um, because, you know... The, the thought of expecting somebody to come along to five meetings in a row in a week. Society and culture has changed so much. That would be a very difficult thing to do. So you can see the point you're making. We've got to think, what's the best way of fishing now, now that we are in a completely different context and culture? Um, I remember in Pinho Road, we had just started um, Messy Church. This is going back a, a few years. And, um, you know, Loads of children everywhere and invited the local MP, Ben Bradshaw, to come and have a look. And he was completely blown away because he'd seen the statistics, if you like, in church life of how you no know, attendance at Sunday school was going down and down and down. I said, yes, but the stats don't reveal what's happening through messy church, which often doesn't take place on a Sunday and how across the nation. And he said, oh, so you no, know, the church is still alive and active. And yes, but in different ways, things get changed according to context. We used to hold messy church next to immediately after the local schools closed. They come straight from school um, to, to messy church. Oh, and the stats there, you know, numbers that we gained there in the midweek were far greater than we'd expect to see on, on a Sunday. You see the point I'm making? You've got to adapt and change. If the fish move somewhere else, there's no good bemoaning that the fish aren't there anymore. You've got to go where the fish are. And that might mean changing your strategy and adapting and adopting. It might mean change. Oh, oh there's, a, there's a word. Um, it was once, uh, I once said about my, my first church in Tonopandi a few years in, that they wanted a nice young man from Spurgeon's College. Well, they got that. Nice young man from Spurgeon's <laughs> College with lots of new ideas who wouldn't change anything. Indeed. So, you don't have to be a Peter to be a fisher of men. Peter was, you know, a fairly, I think, in-your-face sort of guy. He was a foot-in-mouth sort of guy. He was there quickly. He was out there. You know, Peter, if you were in a party, you'd soon see him, you'd soon hear him. You would know that Peter was there. Andrew, I suspect, was a quite different sort of character. A more sort of quiet one-to-one -one character. And in, in the way that this story goes, I mean, Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter and just says, come and see. He doesn't explain to him what Jesus has said in terms of the kingdom of God. Perhaps he wouldn't be any good at explaining it. But he does say to his brother, come and meet Jesus. And then the conversation can go on. Let me t remind you again. Andrew, Simon's Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard, this is from John's Gospel, who heard what John had said, that Jesus was the Lamb of God, and would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Let's play with this difference for a minute between Andrew and Peter. As I've said, judging by what we know of their personalities and characters, they were quite different. And I wouldn't be surprised if Peter, Simon Peter, wasn't the easiest of brothers to get along with. Perhaps Peter could be quick-tempered. We certainly know that he was impulsive, impetuous, perhaps even arrogant at times. And I suspect that uh, Peter must have often 
acted and spoken what we might call out of turn. Now, in my experience, brothers can have an uncanny knack, sometimes of winding each other up the wrong way. Would, that be, would other people want to agree with that statement, that brothers can wind each other up the wrong way? My brother isn't putting his hand up. He sat right there, and I'm winding him up right now, but he's not admitting that I'm winding him up right now. Well, if that was the case between uh, Simon and, uh, and Andrew, then credit Andrew for sticking in there with his brother so that he had the sort of relationship that when the opportunity came, he could introduce his brother Peter to Jesus. Let's throw the net wider. Thank you, Frank. What then of your relationships with members of your family? It may not always be easy. But perhaps for the sake of their salvation, it behoves us to make every effort to build and keep the bridges open so far as it depends on you. I mean, it might be that the person doesn't respond. That's not your fault. But as far as it depends on you, try and keep those bridges of communication open, even if it means at times turning the other cheek, even if it means that you have to do the Christian thing and show grace. when the other person doesn't deserve it. I don't know how many arguments Andrew and Peter had when they uh, grow up. I've had you know, four sons, and I know that sometimes brothers argue. <laughs> they fall out. Uh, Sandra can also give testimony from by the look on her face. So three sons. Yeah, you know, brothers can fall out with one another. So the principles to apply. Andrew's way of fishing for others was very different from that the person who went before him, who was John the Baptist. Here you've got the set up a tent in a desert sort of evangelist. John, John the Baptist, he, he went off somewhere. I mean, he was a character, wasn't he? I mean, eating locusts and, and wild honey. I'm not suggesting that anyone here is being called of God to change their diet quite so radically to become an effective evangelist for God. But hey, if you feel the Lord speaking to you on that one, I'd love to know about it, and I'll pray for you. Um, so you've got you know, the John the Baptist ministry, which is very public. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You've got Peter himself on the day of Pentecost proclaiming to thousands in Jerusalem that Jesus who had been crucified was in fact the Messiah of God. And people are cut to the heart as the Holy Spirit convicted them of their sin. And they said, what must we do to be saved? Repent, he says, and believe the, uh, believe the good news and be baptized. And thousands were baptized on that very day. So again, big public declaration. But there will be times when it's just the quiet word. Later on in Acts, you've got Peter and John, and they go to the temple and they meet the man who is begging. Peter and John went to pray. They met a blind man on the way. See, there's loads of songs for this nostalgic thing. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. Now then, if you read that account, it's all Peter. The other apostle, John, doesn't get a mention. He's just standing there. So what's he doing to fish for men? Well, perhaps what his role was to pray for Peter, that Peter wouldn't put his mouth in the wrong place. Because he knew him. So you've got Peter who's talkative, and there's John who doesn't say a word, but I suspect was praying very much for Peter would say the right thing. Both essential in fishing for others. Are you more of a Peter or are you more of a John? Are you more of a Peter or more of an Andrew? What I'm saying is sometimes, if I think back, sometimes we try to squeeze what you've got to do to witness and be evangelistic into a one-size-fits-all mold, and it doesn't work. We need something that fits our own personality and character and recognize that and ask God to show us, okay, Lord, I am me, and I'm hopeless of going up to a stranger and just talking to them. That's just not me, Lord. Don't ask me to do it. But he might ask you to do something else that is more up your street. 
wives. Listen up now, wives. This is the Apostle Peter speaking. It's not me, but listen. In the same way, defer to your husbands, and the assumption here is that they are husbands who do not believe, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your life. So Peter is saying to these uh, wives, you ain't going to nag your husband into believing. And the more you try and nag them into the believing, the further away you'll probably push them. Let them just see the quality of your life and let them then ask the questions. Now, the context there was wives and husbands. It could be the other way around, husbands and wives. It could be any relationship within a family or within a friendship. You have to judge, Lord, is it appropriate to say something or not? And sometimes you just need this, the wisdom of the Spirit to know the difference between the two. But sometimes the Lord will give you a nudge to say something when you thought you, you were sort of got the, uh, you know, the license that says, Lord, I don't have to say something. Because you never know when the good Lord, because he's the boss, might do something different just to challenge us. So there are times when the less or the fewer words, the better, get my grammar correct there. Also times when it might be more words, the better. Because the same Peter, a little later on in the same letter, says this, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So there are times when it will be right to speak. But it's again interesting that Peter says, if somebody asks you, and then you've got permission um, to say it. Basically, what type of fisher of people is Jesus calling us to be? Calling you to be? Calling me to be? Where are you called to fish? I'm not called to be a Billy Graham. I remember once when I first, uh, when I was, well, Billy Graham died now, isn't he? But I was, so I must have been quite young when I first uh, heard him. And I heard him preach this sermon, and to be honest, I was not very impressed. I thought it was a rather poor sermon. And in my youthful hubris, I was thinking, oh, I could have preached a better sermon than that. And then Billy Graham issued an appeal. This was in Bristol, in Bristol City Stadium. He issued an appeal. And people were getting up all around me. There was no psychological manipulation, no music playing, and they streamed down uh, the front. I knew this. I might have preached my better sermon. I might have then made an appeal, and nobody would have moved an inch. It's not my gifting. It's not my calling. See? So I, I'm, I've long since stopped beating myself up that I'm not like a, a Billy Graham. God has gifted me differently and in other ways it's about finding you know, what is it that god is giving me to do who is he giving me to to speak to or to give a nudge even it's just to say well look come and talk to so and so they'll be able to explain things far better than me or have you ever thought of going on a you know an alpha course something as simple as that and you might be doing your bit and then fishing for people If in all this you feel a sense of inadequacy, great. God's power is made perfect through inadequate and weak people. It's as we surrender our weaknesses and our inadequacies to him, so that when something happens, God gets the glory and not you and me. Because if it had just been you and me, nothing would have happened. So if God does it through you, we think, wow, I'd have never have thought that, Lord. You use me? Yeah, you use me. To him be the glory in all of that. Oh, and I don't know if this is a word for somebody here or somebody who's uh, watching on YouTube later. But for instance, are you feeling perhaps you might be called to explore going out with BMS World Mission to other parts of the world? He's calling you to go fishing for people not just here in the UK or in your own locality, but somewhere else in the world. BMS World Mission do a great job of matching people up with their gifts and abilities to where they need to be. And of course, Pete and Louise are primary examples of that, as is also Judy Cook, the people whom we support here through BMS World Mission. What can you do this week? 
Well, can I direct you to Colossians chapter 4 and verses 2 to 6. The Apostle Paul says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then he says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. In other words, Paul is saying, pray for me that I'll be given the opportunity to speak well of Jesus to somebody. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Paul was probably there uh, chained to a Roman soldier 24-7 in Rome and he's not sat there miserably thinking, oh, I can't go and witness to anybody. I had plans to speak, you know, at the big uh, place in, in Rome and crowds come and listen to me. No, he's restricted. He can't go where he wants. So does he? No. He prays that in that circumstance, that were not of his choosing, that he would probably be quite glad to get shot off in chains, he is still praying, Lord, give me an opportunity to speak well of Jesus to someone. And I used to tell that to people, especially there was somebody who was in and out of hospital all the time, and I got her to understand, perhaps while you're there, you will have an opportunity to speak well of Jesus to someone. So instead of feeling sorry for yourself, I was a bit blunt, you know, you can be looking for opportunities to speak to others, whether it's nursing staff or fellow patients, about Jesus. And do you know what? There were times come when I'm thinking of this particular uh, lady, um, she would almost look forward to the next time she would go into hospital because she knew she'd have opportunities to speak to people about Jesus. And she wasn't, you know, you, you can't just go into a, a ward and say, can I be admitted, please? I want to witness to Jesus to somebody. You know, this, it wouldn't work. Don't, don't even try it. All right. But if you are in situations where it's not of your choosing, you'd rather not be there, and you're in danger even of feeling sorry for yourself, Lord, am I here for a reason? Is there someone I can speak to? Someone I can just say, perhaps, have you ever thought of going to church on a Sunday? It's as simple as that. But you're doing what Andrew did when he went to Peter and said, come and see. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly. As I should, in Ephesians, he says, pray that I may proclaim it boldly, that is, without fear of what somebody might say to me. And be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. The old authorized version translates that as redeeming the time. Time can be bought back for Jesus. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So in this witnessing, what you don't do if you're in the hospital bed is get up and pull the bed sheets off someone else and take them by the scruff of the neck and say, listen to me as I tell you about Jesus. Don't try it. It won't work. I've seen people use aggressive witnessing techniques and I have cringed. <laughs> Gracious, be loving, don't be fearful, be clear. Give you a test. There are so, so many ways. My experience is, if you pray this prayer from Colossians, Lord, give me an opportunity this week. A, he'll tailor it to you, your particular style and character and personality. But he delights to answer that prayer. He loves giving you opportunities to commend Jesus to others. Why not take it on board? I'm not preaching this series from Simon to Peter just so that you're better informed in the head about Simon becoming Peter, right? And that's not God's intention either. It's about how we're, however old or young we are in the faith, in moving us along that journey, discovering how it is that God wants to use us in making Jesus known. I just caught sight there of Frank and Yvonne. We're back into the schools this week, aren't we? We've opened the book on Wednesday. You know, no longer having to, we've used this room as a film set, haven't we? You know, and some wonderful Oscar-nominated acting has taken place in this very room, hasn't it, Carol? <laughs> All right. But now, going back into school, and some of the, uh, the emails in the loop about that, people are excited. Yes! Back into school, being able to open the book, the scriptures of people. So pray for us on, on Wednesday. Which school are we going in? You're not moving your lips, but I can hear you. <laughs> yes, we're going to that school that needs evangelism big time, St. Mark's. Where Sandra is head of RE. So, yeah. Oh. 
So, you know, uh, pray for us uh, in that and pray that we won't upset any of the staff, all right? Okay. So I think you've got the message, all right, about being a fisherman or a fisherwoman. There's lots of different ways, styles and right and wrong approaches according to where you are and what you are doing. Open the book from Bible Society is one way in which is culturally appropriate to children in schools. Uh, and that's what we're about. And if, some, if that, something like that captures your imagination, or you say, yes, I want to be praying for you on Wednesday and commit to being a pray part, prayer partner or, not, or, or whatever, Sarah is also involved in ministry and open the book. So, you know, just say, look, let me know when you're going into schools. This is for Open the Book on Wednesday. We are going fishing. I like that. And apparently you can get fish of all different colors. <laughs> and, you know, you might be more appropriate one way of fishing for one fish with one color than another. Anyway, I've made the point. Now then, is it time to finish the sermon? Yeah, yeah I thought it was. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who prayed for me, for those who spoke well of you to me, and thank you for hauling me in in your nets. Thank you for the salvation that I call my own, and yet I know it's all of you and of your grace. We thank you for those who played their part in being fishers of people that resulted in us coming to faith. And there might be people who now spring to mind. You might want to just name them with thanksgiving before the Lord. And you may now want to be saying, Lord, for that opportunity, this coming week, this coming month, whether it's one we're planning for in the diary, like open the book on Wednesday, or whether it's one that will be completely unexpected and come out of the blue, Lord, help us to be ready speak well of Jesus, to be able to commend him to others as Lord and as Savior. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing a song now that I suspect uh, might be new to some of us, if not most of us here. It was a song that was commissioned in 1992 for the Baptist Assembly of that year. It's called, How Do We Start to Touch the Broken Hearts with the Chorus that the World May Believe. Now, Tom was playing it at the start of the service. He played it while the offering was taken up. So I suggest that um, you remain seated. I'll, I'll sing along uh, with the first uh, verse and chorus, and then we'll go back to the first verse uh, when I'll, you'll, you'll, you, can, you can stand if, you, if you're able and join in with me. Okay, thank you, Tom.
to hear what was on Jenny's naughty list. Well, we had this discussion, you see, about my naughty list, and we decided that there was no way I could put it right myself. I, I needed help. So we thought about it and discussed it all different ways. I mean, what were you thinking of doing, Josh? Going back in time. That would have been good, and I wouldn't have done it. I would have known what I know now. But we decided in the end, the only person that could help us was Jesus. Because if we go to him, and we're really sorry for what we've done, mistakes we've made, he will forgive us. So we thought we'd make plaques to hang up at home, because when we give our hearts to Jesus, we learned last week that we get a new name to go with our name, which is Saint. So I am now known as Saint Jenny. So we made plaques to hang up in, the, in our bedrooms so that we can remember that we can always go to Jesus when we need to, and he'll forgive us. And they've worked really hard this morning. Thank you.